Apparently, I am Donald Dempsey, but I think that's a, a vile rumor. <laughs> uh, this is called Feline Friends. We'll just step into a book. Curled up on the couch with a curled up kitten cradled in your lap. Both of you totally out of this world. I smile at such a lovely double take, tiptoe around the flat, afraid that you should wake. I kiss both your noses, and you both sniff and shift, adopt new synchronized poses. I can only love and sit and watch as one of you makes a move that the other will match. I take a pole ride as I am leaving, place it between your toes where, on awakening, it will be seen to show you how very beautiful you've been. Thank you. Um, I was walking the island this morning, and you can see by the distressed, windy nature, uh, they were in my back pocket, <laughs> so they barely survived. Uh, this is called Passing Strange. When uh, Otello is wooing Desi, uh, he doesn't, he, she, he wins her by the stories he tells, the adventures. And they're not just strange, they're passing strange, surpassing strange, okay? So this is called Passing Strange. Rose arose and having risen was angry. You never call me by my name, only love and darling. A rose by any other name would smell as sweet, I quoted. That's neat, she sweetly smiled. That's Shakespeare. I whispered in her ear and kissed her sweet, sweet smile. Each reflected in the other's eye. Oh, quote me that kiss again, she sighed. How I do love thee, I cried. Let me count the kisses, she replied. My lovely darling Rose. Oh, um, we had a friend staying over at her house because he was doing a gig for us. And I asked him what did he like, and we're a, an Earl Grey household, uh, no sugar. And he was Earl Grey, slice of lemon. So this poem. Oh yes, and we had to do um, bump for the gig. And I was trying to pretend that Dino was my reflection, my shadow, and I finally settled on uh, Dino was my imaginary friend. <laughs> and then I asked his partner in the audience, what, you can see him too? And then I turned to the wrong side and said, what side is he on? And then I said, ah, he's behind you. I, I'm not falling for that trick. So, imaginary friend. Have you, any of you got imaginary friends? No. You used to. You used to. I'm your imaginary friend. I've got there yet. Earl Grey, slice of lemon. Cathy was my imaginary friend. Went everywhere together, did everything together. We two were as one. But alas... Cathy was not long for this world. She got run over by a milk flow. I can still hear the rattling of the bottles with the blue tops. No! I screamed as if we were in a slow-mo movie. She kept smiling at me as the float flattened her. I guess she got the physics of the real and the imaginary world tangled up. Never saw it coming. Death was instantaneous. She couldn't have felt anything. There was milk everywhere. After that, I stuck to who I knew were of this world. I have now three, yes, three, uh, 3D friends. Really, Julie. Mum was relieved, stopped setting the table for two. She'd only ever wanted the wood child. Uh, no, thank you. I never take me look. Earl Grey, slice of lemon. <laughs> uh, this is Sark of the Channel Islands. Uh, I was reading the Sark bit, and it's 1933 34. And Charles Wood, apparently, is the top notch travel writer. It seems as difficult to begin to sing the praises of Sark as it was hard to leave the island when that unhappy time came. One's pen should be dipped in sunshine. I don't know what happened today. Words should come forth, breathing the incense of early morning, the fresh winds of heaven. Our page should be made up of sparkling sea, scented moors, rocks and precipices, infinitely grand, delicious solitudes, and indescribable charm that Sark alone possesses. Dear, dear. Ah, God. That was then. <coughs> 
So this is, uh, as you can see, I've just wrote it today. This is called Pen Dipped in Sunshine. Is that actually in that book? That's actually right? in that book. <laughs> All, and this is about us just coming to the house, uh, being poets together, being people together, and our first night. All afternoon, the ghost of a daytime moon follows us around, wondering what us humans get up to. Sark unfolds itself treasure by treasure, delighting in itself and we in it. The sun immerses itself in the sea, we watch its evolutions. And now the plough hangs in the sky, posed in pristine perfection, as if each star could be plucked from its constellation, taken home in the mind. The moon guarding the house, the sleepers dreaming. Oh, yeah. And this book is called Jerry Sweeney's Mammy. When I was a young fella, I didn't know about the facts of life. Uh, Jan is busy filling me in at the moment. Um, I thought that I was under the illusion that a chap could have three mammies. And this was because I didn't know any biology and I wasn't doing a biological definition of a mammy. It was an emotional definition. And I thought that anybody who could love you to that nth degree must be a mammy. Ergo. So, uh, I had my own lovely mother, Rita. I had Mrs. Lizzie Sweeney up the road, and I had my Aunt Mary down in Cork. And even by that emotional definition, my daddy was a mammy as well, too. Oh. When my mother had to take me aside and tell me, Jerry Sweeney's mammy is not your mammy. And I was going, what? Oh. <laughs> so, yeah, joking. Cotton, as we say in Ireland. Jerry Sweeney's mammy. Mrs. Sweeney was Jerry Sweeney's Mammy. And even though I had my own, I had her on loan. It was like having a spare mammy. And even when she was mad with us, she, she just couldn't be mad with us. Go on, children. Go on. You'd wear the heart out of a stone. And if you fell and you were crying, heart and knee, badly grazed, or badly bitten by a bee, she would hug you up with all herself. Ah, come here to me, you poor little dose. Wrap you up in so much love that would last for years, for years. Jerry Sweeney was my best friend ever, way back in the way back then. Still is, nothing's changed, except that us young fellas have become our fellas, who still think they're young fellas. And every time I see him, I could almost cry. I can still see his mammy smiling out of his eyes. Oh. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> um, I, I'm 60, going on to my 62nd birthday now, and I wanted to bring this out when I was 60, but uh, all my family started dying around me, all the important people, and the book just got waylaid, and then it just got brought out, because it had to be brought out. So this is called Now We Are 60. I'm a, I was a supply teacher, I no longer am a supply teacher, and usually when you're a supply teacher, you go in, you go, uh, what am I teaching them today? And they haven't left any work, and you have to wing it, and you think, what do I do now? And then <coughs> you ask the class, uh, okay guys, what did you do last lesson? And all the class go, nothing. <laughs> like that. And they're all afraid to tell you what they did last time, in case you make them do more of the things they did last time. And then there's always somebody, there's always a Julian in the class at the back, and he goes, Please, sir. Yes, Julian? We did the spinach armada. And I go, right, the spinach armada, okay. And I thought, I leave that alone. I said, what did you do before that? And I said, quite this again. And then the Julian at the back of the class said, Please, sir. Out of cleavage. And I thought, I'm not going to go there. I'm not going to go there. And then the next day, I bought in all bunches of spinach and Seville oranges, and we bombarded the spinach <laughs> and that. Then I went into year eight, and everybody was doing a pirate accent, an OR accent. And uh, it was nowhere near National Pirate Day. So they're just disrupting you. So I thought, right, okay. So I said, I was doing Pythagoras, and I said, ah, as you can see, the ship on the hypotenuse is equal to the sum of the ships on the other two sides. Oh, wow. <laughs> and I thought, oh, God, this guy's uh, got our you. number. So this is called, Now We Are Sixty. A year eight child inquires, how old I be? I be just sixty. 
He gasped. My God, you're very active for 60. <laughs> 60 for him is a distant planet in a galaxy far, far from here. <laughs> Yay, another dimension. I smile my 60-year-old smile, perfected by now. I am starlight that will only reach him when he is himself 60. If he ever remembers what he has long ago forgotten. Yeah. Thank you. Mm. How is everybody's chaucer? Bon that apple with a sure sota, the draught of March had parsed to the rota, and bad that every vine is switch liqueur, of which for two, when genre is the floor. You okay with that? You're good on Chaucer. Yeah. <laughs> so the reason why I'm good on Chaucer is I'm a 12 year old kid, I've just gone into uh, secondary. Uh, uh, I'm dyslexic, highly dyslexic, and I'm trying to read my way out of Janice to constantly correct me still in my 62nd year. So, um, um, the teacher starts uh, spouting about something about Karl Marx, and I go, I've read the Communist Manifesto, and I go, sir, sir, on uh, page 52, Marx actually says, and he goes, oh, you've read the Communist that. Manifesto, and I said, yes. And I used to go in and I read all Beckett because there were nice slim little plays, Louis McNeese and Mr. Farrell in Newbridge. I used to travel three miles in, walk three miles in and order Louis McNeese collected poems. And Mr. Farrell looked at this little fan of your own going, are you sure you want this, son? And then he used to get me everything, everything. <laughs> Louis McNeese, uh, I started with Louis McNeese. I love Louis McNeese. The sunlight on the garden hardens and grows cold. We cannot cage the minutes within its nests of gold. Oh, God. And this lovely autobiography book. I, when I was 13, I had only enough money to get a bus fare up to Dublin, walk around, couldn't buy myself an ice cream or anything like that. I would just walk around, uh, go and see the Jeff B. Yates in the gallery, uh, and just be in Dublin. I was a country hick, so Dublin was, oh, look at me, I'm in the big smoke. And then I had only enough money to get back. And what happened? You squandered it. I saw a record that said Louis McNeese reads Louis McNeese. And I thought, uh, so I was on the horns of a dilemma. Do I get home or do I buy the record? So I did what any 12, 13 year old would do. I bought the record and I walked 40 miles home and I get home at 60, 6 o'clock in the morning and they are frantic. And I said, I got a Louis McNeese, a Louis McNeese record. And I put him on thinking he'd read beautifully, but he, he reads in an English accent. Oh, the sunlight in the garden hardens and gets cold. And I thought, <laughs> and I thought oh, Louis, you're supposed to be Irish for God's sake. <laughs> so, this is called, so, Pricket Hem Nature in Her Courageous. Never did help my da enough. Always head stuck in a book. Donald's son, he'd call. Can you, can you hold this while I saw? Ah, oh, da, I will. Me lost in Chaucer and his tail. And so the saw saws. But all I see is, yo, the miller was a chap of 16 stone, a great big fella bit of but the brawn and bone. He did well out of it. He could go and win the ram at any wrestling show. Say what, Julian? <laughs> the saw cuts through the afternoon, pauses, then Chaucer's on again. Oh, don't get me wrong. I adore the aesthetic beauty of sawdust floating in a universe of its own, suspended in sunlight and shadow. The smell of pine kidnapping my mind. The green dance of the bubble in a spirit level. Didn't have time for all that hammering and song. I was a boy on a mission ever since our teacher sighing. I don't know why I teach you scruff, Chaucer. You'll never read the book. But by the weekend, I ha ha had. My poor old da only getting begrudging help. Juan la apro. The words falling like gentle rain upon my mind. But as sure as sota, the draught of march. Words, words, oh sweet words, had parsed to the rota. My mind bad at every vine and switch liqueur. The bubble in the spirit level poised perfectly, perfectly poised. Of which for two, the is the floor. Thank you. Thank you.